by my father, by the noted Scottish poet and novelist, John Burnside. And John will be introduced by the award-winning writer and poet, Tishani Doshi. Uh, literature is a very important part of the British Council's work in cultural relations. And uh, through our work in literature, we promote dialogue, debate, and the exchange of ideas between uh, writers and readers in India and the UK. And this year, we're particularly excited that we're hosting the Edinburgh World Writers Conference. Uh, and John will be speaking on the theme of freedom of expression and free speech tomorrow. And this is in partnership with the Edinburgh International Book Festival. So without further ado, please uh, give a warm welcome to John Burnside and Tishani Doshi. Thank you. OK. Good morning, everyone. It's really quite an honor for me to be here. Um, John Burnside calls himself a Melville groupie, and I would call myself a Burnside groupie. So this is a great moment for me to introduce someone who I think is one of the most exciting writers, poet, novelists um, working in the English language today. Um, I first was given a copy of John's poems in 2006, The Good Neighbor, and it's a book which is very well worn now and that I've carried with me for a long time. And, and then I read this extraordinary book, A Lie About My Father, shortly afterwards. Um, the thing that struck me about John's language is that it was so sensual, so much about the body, about um, the landscape. And, and what I was reading in English contemporary poetry was quite, um, for want of a better word, male. and. Um, I felt this sort of sensuality and lyric quality in your work so surprising, especially when I read about how you grew up. <laughs> so just to begin, as a very basic question, I would like you to tell this audience how a boy who grows up in Cowdenbeath and Corby, who uh, works in the computing industry and publishes his first book at the age of 33, goes on to write 13 collections of poetry, eight novels, two memoirs, and two collections of short stories. That's an astonishing amount of work. In other words, how did you become a writer, John? Mm, well, um, I guess the answer to the, the pro prolific output is I don't actually have a life, you know? <laughs> uh, I, and I, that, and a combination. Can, can you hear, everyone, can you hear? One more, closer. Oh, oh, how's that? Oh. <laughs> okay, um, and, and, and that and insomnia, I have extreme insomnia, insomnia. but um, no, uh, I think uh, my upbringing was such that uh, my, my father and I had a constant, um, you know, kind of uh, aggressive, uh, male, um, head-banging, kind of head-butting uh, relationship, and my father my, what my father stood for was um, being hard, being obdurate, being, uh, you know, the last person standing, as it were, mm -hmm. if it's in a fight or, or drinking or whatever it might be. And so I think because of those were his values, and I was oppo so opposed to him, my values went the other way. And so I, I was more interested in, you know, like you say, the, 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 the tender side of the body, um, um, uh, lyrical experiences, um, gentleness, and, and a kind of ser search for compassion. I'm not saying that I was, you know, kind of a saint. Mm -hmm. because I grew up in that environment, and during my teenage years, I did live in that environment, and it was quite violent, and there was a lot of drugs and alcohol, and so it was quite an unpleasant scene in lots of, in lots of ways. And yet, at the same time, through one of the drug experiences, I began to feel that, that I could see the possibility of another kind of way of, of living. Mm -hmm. So that I, I refer to LSD as my real sacrament, yes. um, as opposed to the Catholic um, host, which was yes. what's supposed to bring you to some kind of spiritual revelation. Yes. I didn't do it. Yeah. So, and, but then, of course, then you have to go beyond that. And how did you actually come to writing, though? Because you, you worked, sort of, you, you, you mentioned in your book that you were in the computing industry, that you worked in banks and insurance companies. And, and at what stage do you decide that you are going to be a poet and a writer? Well, I, I actually started writing poetry um, to try and use the other half of my brain. Mm -hmm. I didn't think of myself, I thought of myself as having a hobby of writing poetry. Um, because I remember the story, uh, T.S. Eliot's boss, 
was being interviewed and they said, you know, now T.S. Eliot's quite a famous poet and the boss has asked, what do, how does it feel to have T.S. Eliot as one of your employees? Mm -hmm. And the boss said, oh, we, we like our employees to have hobbies. <laughs> So the, the boss just saw T.S. Eliot's poetry as a hobby. And I think I saw that as the same way. And I didn't think of myself as being like T.S. Eliot. But I mean, I, I was working all day with numbers and logic and programming and those kinds of things. And it was, I felt it was a kind of you know, perceived lack for myself. Yes. Um, and I did other things too, but um, writing poetry satisfied something for me. But I didn't keep that poetry to begin with. When I heard you, the first time I heard you speak was at the Hay Festival in Wales. I think it was also in 2006. And you said something very beautiful that has stayed with me. You, you said that when you, that poetry, you compose it on the lips. And that it, it was sort of in your mind and on the lips, as it were, for a long time before you actually committed it to paper. And because you write across genres, I was wondering if you could just say a bit about the process of writing a poem as opposed to prose, because you go sort of seemingly effortlessly between the two. Yeah. Well, uh, the, the image I had of what the poet did came straight out of the film Dr. Zhivago. Mm -hmm. I thought the poet, when a poet sits down with a piece of paper and uh, a fancy pen in a cabin with snow all around and wolves are howling outside <laughs> and, and Julie Christie is asleep in the next room. Uh, <laughs> you know, if only. Which I have no complaints about that, you see. So um, I thought that's what po poets, and you look like Omar Sharif, you're really handsome, mm -hmm. you know, and um, a bit rugged because she's been out kind of traveling miles through the snow. And then you write your poem. And um, I thought that's how poets worked. Mm -hmm. And when I sat down with my pen to write on my piece of paper, nothing came. And um, I started, I used to do a lot of walking. As you can see, I no longer do that. Um, <laughs> but I used to do a lot of hill walking. And, and, and um, I started, um, as it were, composing in my head, as how I saw it. But Mandelstam, Mandelstam uses the Russian poet, uses this term on the lips, composing on the lips. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to me that there was, that was a good test of what you were doing. If you went out for a five, 10 mile walk, and came back with something that was still there that you could write down on a piece of paper, then at least it was memorable enough to last that long. And surely the essence of poetry, music, and memory, and memorability. So if it stayed, if it stayed, I'd write it down. Mm -hmm. Didn't always keep it still, but it was more of a test of it. Yeah. And I never, I decided that I would not compose anything using a pen, mm -hmm. and I never have done since. And the poems I've kept have been poems that were composed on the lips or in my head or however you wow. want to see that. And, and with prose? That's a completely different process. Um, again, there's a lot of thinking in advance. My first novel, the reason I left the computer industry was I went around boring everyone that would listen to me <laughs> about how great my first novel would be well, as soon as I got a chance to actually write it. Mm -hmm. But I was so busy in my job because I couldn't do this. And it's a wonderful excuse. I still use it now and again, I still say, you, can, you can't imagine how good this book would be if only I had the time to do it properly. I think writers are good at making Yeah, for sure, yeah. <laughs> but um, for, for two years, I thought about my first novel. And then somebody just turned around and said to me, oh, shut up and write it then. Mm -hmm. And then, so I went to, to my boss and I gave him my car key. And I said, I'm leaving. Mm -hmm. And so I left to write my first novel. If I was having a midlife crisis. <laughs> um, I was only 39, I, you know, it was a bit of an early midlife crisis. <laughs> I'm still waiting for mine, actually. Um, but, um, you know, this, that was the moment, and I went off and wrote, wrote. And I didn't really know how to write. I, I knew how to figure things out in my head. So I literally had a whole novel in my head. Mm -hmm. It's quite cramped in there. Yes. Yeah. And does it work like a computer hard disk that when you're working on something, you kind of have it in your head, and then you eject it, and then you start working on another, another thing? Or are you able to work on poetry and prose simultaneously? Oh, yeah, no, I can work on... Well, simultaneously, in a, in a sense, doesn't quite apply because the no. process is different. But what is true is like this computer analogy is kind of fair. Um, as soon as I get something onto paper, it's like clearing a register in a computer. Mm -hmm. And people will sometimes, you know, people will ask poets to say a poem of theirs. Yes. And I can say a poem of several other poets, including some contemporary poets, but I could never say a poem of my own. I can never remember an entire poem of my own. Mm. Once it's written down, it's cleared out. And once it's published, um, it's like, goodbye, let's move on to the next thing. And I think that's, you know, that's quite, it's, it's kind of shark-like. You, you, 
That's it's quite, that sounds quite healthy, actually. Yeah. Um, I want, you know, in your book you say that um, you learned from the woods the deep pleasure of being alone. And I think for a writer, um, I just, I want you to talk a little bit about the physical landscape that you come from, because it's so very different from the landscape that we're sitting in and that most of us, you know, um, and your work is so derived from geography and landscape. So mm. if you could tell us a little bit about it. Well, I grew up in industrial towns. Uh, first in Cowdenbeath, which is a dying mining town, and then in Corby, which is a steel town. And um, two things applied, really. One is that the, the, the towns themselves weren't very attractive, um, well, certainly when I was younger. And I, I, w I didn't feel safe in my father's house. So I spent as much time outside the house as possible. And, you know, I, I don't want to get into that kind of solace in nature kind of stuff, you know, because it's too simple. But there was a feeling of authenticity to go out into the woods, mm -hmm. and especially to be alone. Um, Solitude is really, I think for most writers, I think solitude is the kind of base, the kind of staple diet, as it were, for, for, mm -hmm. for writing. And just to go out and be alone in the woods. And um, the other thing is that it makes you name things um, mm -hmm. that are not familiar. Um, you know, if you grew up in an industrial town, you go out in the woods, you see bird, 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 different kinds of bird, but you could, they're not just all birds, you know, and plants. Well, and I was, <laughs> no, sorry, I was going to say that Dylan Thomas famously could only identify a robin and a seagull. Yeah. And he said, like, you know, then you have to go and find out the names of things. Like, clearly you are not that poet because you name a lot, a great deal. In yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm actually a, a natural taxonomist. I actually, taxonomy later on became a kind of hobby of mine, and I work with a, a botany um, a PhD on um, using numerical taxonomy. I use computers in, this is getting very boring, isn't it? <laughs> using in computers to identify different kinds of plants, yeah. to kind of sub-identify different uh, sub-species of plants. But um, yeah, I, I love naming things. It was just a wonderful process. But I remember, I have a kind of vague memory uh, as a child of, of actually being resistant to language, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting because then it became a thing. When I was a baby, my mother took me to see the woman. In Scotland in those days, if you, you still got taken to see the woman. Mm -hmm. And the woman would have been, in one, at one time, would have been the local witch, midwife, healer, whatever it might be. And that's all underground, but they still were doing it. And my mother took me to the woman, and the woman opened my mouth and looked inside my mouth, and he said, oh, he's tongue-tacked. Um, <laughs> tongue tact mm -hmm. um, and that actually it's, it's, it's actually a physical st structure as it were and he said so he'll he'll earn his living by language by using words yeah. Yeah, so my mother thought hopefully I'd be a politician or a lawyer and, and make some money either by corrupt or non-corrupt means um, but then you know um, I actually was quite resistant I felt something and I kind of reproduced that idea in, in my first novel a resistance to fragmenting the world around me into these individual, you know, table, rows, that kind of stuff. There was a kind of resistance to that to begin with. And then I think there's a process. At some point in your life, you begin to understand that there's a richness that comes with naming which doesn't compromise the richness of continuity. And, you know, I think, I think it's, it's the fundamental point of ecology Mm -hmm. That while we look at systems, while we name things, while we break that, that down and analyze it, we must constantly keep in mind that that's all continuous. Yes. You know, and the Dalai Lama was saying it much better than me yesterday. So if anyone was there, uh, you know, I agree with him basically. We, we most of us do. Uh, John, <laughs> you, um, you write a great deal about the environment and, and landscape, and I was wondering if you could read some poems, but also address this idea of um, writing for a particular purpose, for a particular uh, cause. Uh, do you feel as a poet that, that you are um, ever in a situation where you need to address? Always, always. The trouble is, um, and this is, this is an expression of ego in a way, um, if you are interested in making something that's a, that's a work of art, you always resist any kind of uh, compromise of the art. But I remember um, when they started using Lucas, the uh, air base near where I lived, to send out supplies in the war against uh, terrorists, so-called, in Iraq. Uh, 
Um, I, I, was, uh, I was infuriated, and I wrote a poem that's called Bass, mm -hmm. as in air bass, but obviously mm -hmm. bass, bass intentions. And, and it was, and I, and I immediately sent it to The Guardian, and they published it immediately because it was topical. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I saw it in print, I thought, that, that's not a poem. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, 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 it's a worthy sentiment, and most Guardian readers would agree with it, so well, what was the point, really? Um, the, the real point would be to get that poem into the express, I suppose, I don't know. Yeah. I uh, better be careful what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I want to, I want, I would like to write a poem that made people stop um, spraying neonicotinoids and killing all the bees. Mm -hmm. I'd like to write a poem that made people stop in er erecting wind turbines everywhere. Um, but a poem isn't going to do that. Mm -hmm. People can do that together. And a poem, or, you know, uh, any number of poems and artworks and, and, and documentaries and things are all, as it were, drops in the ocean, which may eventually add up to something that will change those things. Yeah. But um, it would be, it would be um, vain of anybody to think that they could write a poem that would change the world. Would you read us a poem? Yeah, <laughs> a non-world changing <laughs> poem. <laughs> but I think one of the things that you can do with poetry about the natural world is to just simply celebrate what's there. Mm -hmm. And I think by saying, you know, pointing at something and saying, look, isn't that wonderful? Um, people might think twice about, you know, chopping it down or, or spraying deadly chemicals all over it. And I'm doing a project now with a, an artist in, 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 who lives in England called Amy Shelton, um, and we're working together on a project on bees. We've been working on bees for five years or so. Wow. And we've done one book, so, uh, an artist's book so far, and um, we're doing another stage now. I want to read, um, because the poems, when I've finished and published them, they kind of go out of my head, I want to read from my new um, working collection, which is going to be called All One Breath. Um, and the idea is that, you know, all living creatures share the same air, at least, anyway. And the, the, I want to read the epigraph from the book to introduce the idea of the book. This is from Ecclesiastes, from the Christian Bible. For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts. Even one thing befalleth them. As the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they have all one breath, so that a man has no preeminence above a beast. I think that's probably the central message of this book, this is message, you know. It's that, um, you know, all life is sacred, not just us. Or even our little, more so, our little class. Because as soon as we start putting humans above animals, then we start putting some humans above other humans, and etc. Um, this poem is actually, I want to read this poem, but it's actually not about um, uh, anything to do with nature in a way. Um, there's a sequence of, in the book, it's, it's about mirrors and reflection. And uh, this is just a, basically a true story, as it were. The um, epigraph is from Seneca, the Stoic philosopher, quam angusta in ecantia est ad legem bonum esse. What a narrow innocence it is to, live, to be good according to the law. Hall of Mirrors, 1964. It wasn't a fairground so much, just an acre of clay on old man Potter's land where someone had set up shop to amuse the locals May weed and trampled grass beneath our feet. The perfumes that pass for summer in towns like ours, touched now with the smell of candy floss and diesel, and the early evening dusk made eerie by these strings of fami vert and powder citrus light bulbs round the stalls, where goldfish in their hundreds probed the walls of fish tanks for the missing scent of river. That day, my mother wore her rose print sundress, antique green and crimson in the off-white fabric, some new flora growing wild in infinite reflection, while I turned and turned and couldn't find myself until she picked me out, a squat intruder in the garden she had made, blear-faced and discontent, more beast than boy, more fiend than beast. That wasn't me, of course, I knew as much. And yet I knew the creature I had seen 
And when I turned again and saw him gazing back at me ad infinitum, I knew him better. Baby-faced pariah, little criminal, with nothing to confess but narrow innocence and bad intentions. The back rooms of the heart are Babylon incarnate, miles of verdigris and tallow, and the cries of hunting birds unhooded for a kill that never comes. I saw that when I saw this other self suspended in its coal of tortured glass. And while I tried pretending not to see, my mind a held breath in a house I'd got by heart from being good according to a law I couldn't comprehend, I saw, and I believe my mother saw, if only for a moment, what I was but beyond the child she loved, the male homunculus she'd hoped I'd never find to make me like my father, lost and hungry, and another mouth to feed that never quit its ravening. A moment passed. I was convinced she'd seen, but when I turned to look, her face was all reflection, printed roses, and a blear of Eden from that distance in the glass where anything can blossom, Judas tree and tree of knowledge, serpents gnawing at the roots, the life perpetual that's never ours alone, including us, till everything is choir. Um, this is the this is the final poem in, in the in the book. I think it will be anyway, and it's called Choir, and so it picks up on that idea. It's very short. It is hard to believe, again, that the darkness will sift the essence from the flesh and make it weightless and everlasting. I'd rather think of us as choir. When one voice stops, another rises, first to take its place, then unison. These games we play with song, canon, refrain, polyphony, recitative. The more we sing, the wider ground we make to play in, contrapuntal, all one breath. I noticed that you um, move your feet while you read. It's <laughs> something I do too, and I think maybe it's, it's also in the body that you're composing in your head, but it's also in the body, the rhythm. When the you movement. stand up, when I stand up to read, I... To write, it's... You know, uh, I'd love to say that it was. It'd be nice to um, 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 say, oh, you know, I really suffered writing this, but actually it wasn't okay. because um, for two reasons. And, most, and they're both to do with motivation for the book, why I cho chose to write the book in the first place. The first thing that happened was uh, somebody asked me what's my next project, and I had, until that moment, not consciously thought what my next project was going to be. Mm -hmm. So I can take my glasses and find them. Um, and I said, I'm going to write a book about my father. And then I, I was more surprised than the other person, actually. Um, but the two things were going on. One was my, my wife was expecting our first child, and my wife's family history is just full of great stories. Mm -hmm. um, and, and of course, I didn't have any stories about my father that I knew were true, because he was a, an inveterate liar. And um, also, I knew that there was some kind of you know, dark material in his background about his childhood. Yes. And so I wanted to go out and find what the stories would be that I could tell my son when he was, you know, basically it was competition with my wife. <laughs> So it makes marriage healthy competition. Um, she had all these stories that I didn't have any, so there yeah. was that. But the other thing was when I started thinking about it, I, I thought about how I'd, been, I'd spent several years up until that point and, I, and somehow been focused by becoming a father myself. I always said I wouldn't become a father because I was terrified of becoming the same father my father was. And although I opposed my father growing up and although I'd love to think I'm different from him, um, I look in the mirror now and I see him, you know, I still see him now, um, which I hope, I hope will change when, go, when I get past 62 because he died at 62, so maybe, um, but um, I do reckon, I did recognize that in myself I had the same anger and some, you know, the same uh, predilections, shall we say, 
So I had no, no children. Um, I would be irresponsible someone like me to have children. But then that changed and, and, and for various reasons. And I explore that a little in the book, why I ended up there. And the other, you know, as I say, going along with that, that focus, the light being shone on that relationship, um, it seemed to me that it was important for me to find my father's soul. Mm -hmm. um, when you hate someone, you deny them a soul. If you hate them, you, just say, you basically say, not necessarily consciously, but you basically say, that person doesn't have a soul. I mean, you see it happening with countries, yeah. you know, to, to America, um, the, the terrorists don't have souls. Um, and, you know, that's not a way to start a dialogue, is it? No. I'm going to talk to you, but you haven't got a soul, so you don't really count, right? Um, so I, I thought, this was like a chance to explore. I didn't know if the book would end up being a published book or just a personal exercise to begin with. So I went to see my aunt, my lovely aunt Margaret, um, who was you know, pretty old by then, and she was my mother's older sister, and I thought she might know something about my father's history that I didn't know, or she could clarify at least some of the stories that he told, were they true, what was true, how much was true. And I said, tell me about my father's, I, I knew that he'd been adopted, he admitted to the fact that he'd been adopted. Um, well, he said he claimed that he'd been adopted. And he had an elaborate story. Each time he got drunk, he had a different elaborate story, a different variation on the story of how he became an adopted child. And I said to my, my aunt, tell me about his family, because he never spoke about them <coughs> properly, you know. And, yeah. and he said, what family? And she said he was a foundling. He was found on the doorstep in 1926 during a general strike. And so this is a man who had no family. He didn't even know who his parents were. And um, it would seem that what happened, and, and it was hard to find out because there were no records kept. There was no social security type yeah. of operations yeah. then. So the family that were on, he was on the doorstep took him in for a while. And it would seem that what happened was people kept looked after him until they couldn't anymore and passed him on to someone else. You know, and um, in, in Scotland we have a lovely saying, if someone comes to your house and eats or drinks too much, you say to them, I'd rather keep you a week as a fortnight. <laughs> <laughs> and my father is, was a big consumer of everything, mm -hmm. space, food, drink, everything. And I'm sure what happened was people just couldn't afford to have him around the house. Mm -hmm. And so they just moved him on. So that was the first insight into what his suffering must have been, yeah. to, to have been abandoned completely, to have then been passed from one group to another. In, a, in the poorest, it was considered the poorest uh, township in Scotland in 1926. So it's a very poor place. And he grew up, and uh, you know, yeah, in some ways you could say, of course, he grew up bitter and angry. So I, I just, I, I cried actually when, I, when she told me this because I just thought, well, if only he had told me this. Mm -hmm. If only, it, you know, he, he was ashamed of it and, he, and he, so he lied about it. And he said he'd been adopted by his natural father's brother. His natural father's a bit of a waste, or his brother was a, a religious person and been brought up by this family. And if he told us, I think we would have been able more to accommodate or understand the, the rage and the violence that came out of him. But he didn't because of, because of shame. Yeah. And I thought, well, if this book does one thing, it would, it would just, you know, at least explore that. that people still feel shame about family circumstances, illegitimacy, etc. Well, they do in Scotland, say. So. Yeah. But then the task of the book, and the only reason it would be published was if I could get to a point where I thought I was really honestly and impartially showing my father's subjectivity, his soul. Mm -hmm. And there's one short scene in the book where I think that happens, I'm not sure, I hope it does. And it's just a very simple scene in and I remember it vividly and, and there's no reason for me to remember. I must have been less than nine years old because it was still in Scotland. And he was standing outside in the garden with his back to the house, he's wearing a white shirt and he was looking out to the woods, smoking a cigarette in the rain. And then I remember as a child looking at him and, and, and wondering, why is he out there? What's, what's he doing? And um, if I trace it all back again, it was, either, it was probably either when my mother um, lost her, her second, the second time around as a child, or when she got ill. And I think what he was doing out there, he was out there hiding the fact that he was feeling unmanly emotions, you know. Yeah. Um, he could be maudlin when he was drunk. Yeah. He would get drunk and, and weep like a baby and, and, and 
say how hard everything was for him. But mm -hmm. that wasn't really the emotion because alcohol had fueled that. But this, I think this is a moment when he was just standing there looking at the woods. But I couldn't see his face, so I didn't write that into the scene. All I do is describe the scene. But I feel as though, for me personally, I reached the point where I admitted that my father had a soul, that he had a subjectivity like me. Which is quite a journey because in the book, you, there is a point at which you are almost on the verge of killing him, mm. literally. Um, yeah. It's not just imagine your head, you're standing in a corner with a, with a, with a knife mm -hmm. and, and you are contemplating this. So I think that kind of uh, anger and hatred and then to, to write in some senses, uh, yes, uh, not a love letter, but uh, uh, an exploration of this person as, as a person, as a soul. It, it's a really a beautiful, beautiful book. And, and in the beginning, you, you have a caveat to say, to treat, for us to treat it as a work of fiction, not as memoir. Mm. And um, it's to do, you know, throughout the book, you are playing with boundaries of what is real and what is imagined and what is rational and what is irrational. And, and, and this comes through all of your work. And I want to ask, did you ever at, at some point think of addressing all the, the issues that you had with your father in a fictional form or was it necessary to do it in this fake memoir or <laughs> somewhat memoir well, form? The, I mean, the truth is that um, I didn't create any fictions deliberately in the book. That acknowledgement was to say that, you know, I was so emotionally um, invested in this narrative that I recognized that I would be partisan in all kinds of ways that even I wasn't aware of. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were ways I was aware of being partisan, but there would be things that would come out that would be, you know, partisan and be, be aware. Uh, I didn't want to justify myself, but human beings do that no matter how hard they try, they, they, they just try and paint an extra little bit of light on themselves and a little bit dark on the other person, you know? So I, I said, you know, treat this as, and also I use the techniques of fiction. Yeah. And I think this, this is one of the essential questions about memoir is, how can you write a memoir if you don't record everything? If you only record certain things. Now, of course, if you recorded everything, it'd be, you know, 24 volumes or something. Um, so you have to choose which things you, you record. And of course, I'm doing the choosing. And I thought if my father was choosing the, the scenes in, in our joint life that to put down to, on paper, he would have choos chosen a whole other group of things. Of and, um, and in fact, would have, it would have been a completely different story. And yet, it would be just as true. It'd be his truth. So it's a memoir. And I chose to call it a memoir as opposed to autobiographical writing or life writing or whatever. I had written a, a, a novel, which was set in Colby. And I only got to the end and I realized what I'd done. I'd replaced the father mm -hmm. that I had with a kind of compromised, idealized father whose name was also Tommy, like my father's. Mm -hmm. And it compromised enough to recognize that he had certain weaknesses, but he was the father that I could have lived with. Yeah. So I knew that fiction was too dangerous a ground. I would have given myself, uh, you know, fantasy, wish fulfillment stuff going on there. You say that as a child you were anxious about memory and that you. Um, the sort of the child's notion of time and then you you record quite truthfully and and with a great amount of vulnerability I think your experiences with drugs and alcohol and sort of losing complete days and and having no memory of what happened or where you were and I'm wondering what is as a writer your relationship to this idea of time and memory and has it has it changed oh well, that's a big one. <laughs> I just want to say um, Nabokov. <laughs> um, Speak Memory is a wonderful book. Um, I think memory is it's, it's several things that are dangerous. It's a luxury. It's a necessity. It's, uh, it's like a minefield, you know? Um, and so, you know, it's a dangerous area, and uh, maybe that's why we need high precision tools like poetry and fiction to actually explore it. Um, I've always found it strange that um, professional people who are supposedly responsible would get someone to lie on a couch and tell them randomly their memories, just spill out memories. Like, you know, surely that's a so-called healing process that's going to make you worse if you're not very careful. And I, and I suppose it was a very good um, analyst that yeah. it can be made to work. Um, I have a lot of 
memories that I'm not sure are real, and I have a lot of, you know, just gaps where something must have happened, but I don't know what it was. Um, and that's kind of disturbing. But I think we compose our idea of ourselves by what we remember, or what we choose to remember, that means. Um, and I think it's easy for us to, you know, be Stalinist about our memories and start painting out the bits that actually are inconvenient to remember or, or um, you know, just embarrassing. You know, I mean, if, you, if I've ever met anybody who went through the kind of drug and alcohol fueled years that I did, and they said they were never embarrassed by it or ashamed of anything, well, I would tell them a liar. Because, you know, I, I can look back and see scenes that I really wish didn't happen. Um, and people got hurt, and, pe and I got stupid. Um, but, you know, so it's really lovely to just airbrush those moments out. Um, and then, in a way, in, in the book, you don't want to inflict them on people either, so you do cut some of them out. But I think you have to show at least a few yeah. to say, look, it, it's also like this. It's messy and ugly and unpleasant and all those things. I, 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 when I was writing this book, and I realized it was, it was verging on the area of confessions, mm -hmm. I started reading a lot of, uh, again in some cases, um, works by people who had written their confessions. And um, the one who got me, that really got my, my blood up was Rousseau. Because you can see him manipulating the whole thing to make himself feel, to make himself look better, and mm -hmm. and what he does, he's a kind of CIA of confessional writers. <laughs> it gives you a little bit of truth, so he can tell you the lies that he wants to tell you too. And I thought I mustn't, I, I really don't want to do that. Right. You know. Would you Would you read a bit, John, from, yeah. from the book, just um, so that we can hear sure. this? This is about my my dad. It's quite a short passage. Um, when, he, when, it, when I was uh, 10, he had a, an accident. He was a construction worker at that time before he moved to Corby. And um, he, fell, he fell from some scaffolding. And uh, it was a transition point in his life. What I didn't know until later was that he was paid quite a lot of money for this accident for compensation because it was his employer's fault. Um, and um, he, he got enough money to almost to buy a, a house in those days. And my mother knew this, and she took us to see a house when we moved to Corby that we could have put down about three quarters of a payment, and he wouldn't do it. And the sum of money that he was paid, I imagine, pretty much got spent at the local pub. But um, this, is, this is actually the, the, getting the news of the accident. And uh, there's something quite shameful in this. I'll let you work out what that is. I could never work out why the Donaldsons lived in the prefabs. Nobody else had a car, but they did. They had a phone, too, and a caravan somewhere, and they took holidays in places we'd never heard of. Their son, Daniel, was a strong, unsuspecting, generous-hearted boy with a temper, but he was also the local peacemaker, the one who stopped fights before they went too far, the player referee in every game from football to rounders the voice of reason, well served by a workaday imagination and the impenetrable authority of the only child. I suppose if you had to receive bad news, you would rather Daniel brought it than anybody else. And that is exactly what he did for my mother that winter, just a fortnight after her father finally died of the cancer he'd been fighting for months. She was alone in the house, baking, listening to the wireless in the kitchen, when the shadow appeared at the frosted pane of our back door. I think she would have been happy that day, even though her father had just passed. She was usually happy when she was allowed to get on with the routine maintenance of our world, the cooking, the cleaning, the baking. Baking was our favorite chore, and she baked a good deal, partly because it was a cheap source of treats, and partly, I suppose, because she knew the cakes she made were amazing. Everybody liked them. My cousin Dave, who was notoriously averse to family occasions, would come to our house on any excuse just to have a slice of my mother's fruitcake and one of those rich, frighteningly delicious confections she called melting moments. <laughs> like everything else she did, 
She baked by feel. There was no clock in her kitchen, no egg timer. She knew every cake was different, and she judged how well it was doing by the smell. That day she was making angel cakes in a Victoria sponge. Nothing got spoiled because Daniel offered to stay behind after she left and take care of things. He had come to tell her that my father had been hurt in an accident at work. It wasn't anything to worry about, he said, but somebody had telephoned to say they were sending a car to take her to the hospital in Dunfermline. Daniel didn't know how extensive my father's injuries were, but even if he had, he wouldn't have said anything more or less than what he had been told to say. An accident, a fall, nothing to worry about. No hurry, car coming. Nobody would know how bad it was anyhow until the ambulance arrived at emergency and the doctors examined him. My father had fallen around 30 feet from a scaffold. Now he was unconscious, barely breathing, his lungs weren't working properly, his face was badly battered. I didn't see him for weeks, and even then, I didn't recognize him. We found out later that his skull had been fractured, all the ribs on one side were broken, one of his lungs was punctured, he had broken teeth, broken bones in his face and hands, his left leg was broken. When she came to break us the news, my mother said it was typical of our father to do nothing by halves. He hadn't broken every bone in his body, but he'd broken enough that he could claim he had without fear of contradiction when it came time to recount the story. The next two months were slow and subdued. At first, my mother went as often as she could to sit by my father's bed as they waited for him to become fully conscious. Later, she took flowers from the garden, papers, books, fruit, gifts from the neighbors. My father was sure they all despised him, but there wasn't one who didn't send a card or bring round gifts for my mother to take in. Meanwhile, we children waited dutifully for the day when we'd be able to go in with her at visiting time, sitting in the waiting room while she took him our drawings and letters, touching empty letters from children who didn't really know what to say, drawings of trees and flowers, drawings of the prefab with smoke coming out of the chimney and the lilac tree in bloom by the back door. Finally, we were allowed in. I still recall how damaged he looked, lying in his damp looking, slightly stale hospital bed, his eyes purple and swollen, his mouth grim with dry spittle, his voice a thin croak. This was the biggest shock for me, that his voice had dwindled so, faded to a shadow of itself. This and the penitent, humbled air he had about him, the air of one who has been chastened, considerate of others, quiet, thoughtful, plugged into some undercurrent of fear he didn't manage to deny for years but could no longer evade. He'd almost died, he would say later, and everybody knew he was right. It was a drama, a real event. For once, he didn't need to make anything up. It was all true. Meanwhile, life at the prefabs was close to idyllic. My mother didn't have any money. Even though we'd been told there would be compensation payments, she wasn't holding her breath. But we were strangely happy in our quiet home, all of us working together, doing our best, looking after one another. My father had sent a message that I would have to be the man of the house for a while and look after my mother and Margaret. But at 10, I was smart enough to ignore that particular piece of advice. Mm. Best of all were the nights when we got back from Mrs. Banks' house and having sat long enough with my mother to hear the latest news, we forgot my father altogether and moved on to the ordinary things that were so imperiled while he was there. Listening to the radio, reading, playing games, Sitting, sitting quietly around the fire while my mother knitted a matinee jacket. She was always knitting matinee jackets for some cousin's baby. We were happy then, and though we would never have admitted to it ourselves, none of us really wanted it to end. <laughs>
Thank you. Uh, I think we have a um, few, uh, some time for questions. I just, um, <coughs> there are mics around. I'll ask one last question, John. And you know, you, you mentioned in your book that the greatest invention of the Catholic Church was this idea of limbo. Yeah. And you write a, a great deal about this, the beauty of limbo and, and, and what space that occupies. And I, I wonder if you could comment on how you feel that the church has now scrapped and removed limbo from, <laughs> <laughs> that it doesn't exist anymore and that it's... Well, you know, uh, there's, uh, there's one thing you can guarantee institutional institutions will do is get rid of all the good bits of anything, yes. you know. Um, but limbo is wonder lim a wonderful idea, you know, and um, I, the great thing about limbo, I, I never wanted to go to heaven as a child mm -hmm. because um, heaven sounded really incredibly boring. You just spent your whole day praising God, you know. And the other thing was all the people I'd ever heard of who were interesting were barred from heaven yeah. because they were not Christian, you see. Yeah. And, but, the, but the good ones got to go to limbo, you see. So Socrates would be in limbo couldn't go to heaven. Mm -hmm. Aristotle, the, the, the very bedrock of Catholic ideas, couldn't be in heaven because he was, you know, an ancient Greek. And I used to think, how unfortunate. I mean, how, how can one think of a religion where you bar one of the founding ideas of your religion just because you didn't belong to it? You know, you could say that Jesus wasn't a Christian either. Maybe he isn't in heaven either. So all the interesting folks were in limbo. And now that they've got away, done away with it, where have all the limbo people gone? Yeah, where's you know? Aristotle now? <laughs> <laughs> Any questions from the audience? There's quite a few uh, mics, uh, if someone can pass it around. Hello. Um, I haven't really read your book, The Lie About My Father, but uh, you put me in mind of another similar book that I have looked at. Uh, it's by Clark Blaze. Uh, another autobiography, biography, I Had a Father. Uh -huh. I Had a Father, that's the title. And um, it's interesting to see how he uh, writes the book at a point in time when he finds himself growing into the likeness of his own father. And um, he uses this uh, very imaginative trope of lying mm -hmm. because the father was a salesman and lied his way through his profession. And the son grows up to be uh, a writer of fiction, so he lies through his profession. Uh, fiction is not a lie, fiction is the truth. Yes, so I, I, I thought you might want to comment on this, the, the use of the trope lie, mm. as it were. Um, I, I go along with Cocteau. Jean Cocteau said, um, uh, speaking as fiction, he said, I am the lie that always tells the truth. And I think that's why we need fiction, because fiction gets at the truth that we can't tell in documentary way. We can't tell in, as it were, fact. We, I, I don't, I'm not speaking for India, because I, I, I'm completely, this is my first time I've ever been in India, and I'm completely bowled over by it. But where I live, we have a society which is too fact-based. If it isn't factual, it isn't true, you know? And we're still, if it's, if it's related in some way, to something that might not be factual, it still doesn't count. And um, fiction allows us to explore those things that, you know, the bottom line thinking, the kind of factual bottom line thinking doesn't permit. And those are the, those are the essential truths. And um, going back to Seneca, Seneca pointed out that um, the reason why he says um, what a narrow innocence it is to live according, be good according to law is all the things that really make us essential uh, humans um, compassion, um, loyalty, friendship. These aren't things that you can legislate for. But these are, these are the things that matter. So while we do need laws to stop people from you know, stealing, although they don't seem to do very well, um, you know, um, unless, you're, uh, unless you're just a, a, an ordinary kid from Corby, in which case you get 10 years. Um, but if you're a corporate theft, thief, fine, you go ahead. Um, but you know, the, this, is the, this is the world uh, of over emphasis on fact. And so fiction, fiction is looking for that other truth, that essential truth. Um, so actually, I do, I do think, and in fact, there was a kind of game there as well, treat this as a work of fiction. Yeah. I was hoping that it had got that kind of truth that I couldn't have done if I'd you know, recorded every minute factually of what happened. Yeah, got a question back there. Mr. Burnside Dishani, thank you for a very interesting session today. My question is about the economics of poetry. 
Uh, and my question specifically is, do we as readers disappoint you poets when we don't exactly ensure that books of poetry are flying off the shelves? <laughs> because I'm, I'm sure a book of poetry takes just as much, if not more effort, than a well-written uh, book of fiction or non-fiction. So how do you look at that while you are writing a book of poetry? Because you may know that it might not exactly fly off the shelves. My two favorite, my two favorite forms of writing do not fly off the shelves. <laughs> poetry and the short story. They just don't fly off the shelves, sadly. Um, and it's strange, because wherever I go, I ask people what they like, and everybody says, I love short stories. And yet, um, I know there's an expert in the room who can tell me, <laughs> tell me the details of this, but you know, people don't buy short story collections for some reason. Um, and, I, and I don't understand why that is. There are lots of people in, in, in Britain who write poetry. And they slightly outnumber the people who actually read it, <laughs> um, sadly. <laughs> And I think it's strange. How can you think to write poetry unless, I mean, can you imagine trying to paint a masterpiece by not, not looking at the, the art that's been made before, been made by your contemporaries? So I feel quite privileged because um, the publishing company I, uh, I'm, I'm with works very hard on poetry. Not all publishers do that. Some have just dropped it altogether. And um, I'm very glad of that. Um, I have an editor who's one of the best poets in Britain, one of the best poets writing in English, actually, I would say. So I've got this incredible poet editor. The books look beautiful, and we sell more than, <laughs> yeah. Beautiful books, beautiful <laughs> books. We sell, I mean, I certainly sell more than I might do otherwise. And the other thing, of course, is that there's a whole business behind um, ev all aspects of publishing, and um, if you're lucky enough to win a prize, and I was lucky enough to win two, two quite big ones at the same time, then that makes a big difference and it, and it raises your readership, which is great. Um, I think sometimes organizations which are involved with the promotion of poetry don't do poetry any favors by trying to sell it as something else. Mm -hmm. If you love poetry, you love poetry. You don't love a kind of faux stand-up comedy or a sort of pseudo songwriting. You know, poetry, for me, poetry is the kind of fundamental, kind of grassroots literary art. And, uh, you know, I don't want people to read my poetry and think, this is almost as good as, you know, c comedy. Or, well, not, there's not many laughs in my poems as that happens. <laughs> but, you know, it's almost as good as songwriting or whatever. Um, I'm very glad. And another thing about my readership in poetry, which is numbers I imagine in, on a good day in the, in the few thousands, is that those readers are very committed um, to what they're doing. They read poetry passionately. And I'd rather have 2,000 or 5,000 or 7,000 readers who will write me letters, and I, and I believe them when they say that the po a poem of mine made a difference to them, uh, made them think differently about something, or helped them in a difficult time, than having 10 million readers reading my version of, what's it called, Fifty Shades of... Great. Pink. Pink. <laughs> Fifty Shades of Pink were in Jaipur now. I forgot so. the title, sorry. <laughs> I'd, rather, I'd, rather, I'd rather have those readers than the other ones, you know. Not to say that those don't overlap. I hope they do. <laughs> but, uh, There's a question but, right here in the front. Um, my name is Anisha, and I was wondering whether you could talk a little bit about the process of editing poems when you're writing them, because there's been a lot of conversation, I mean, as of yesterday <laughs> at the festival about, from authors about, you know, how you edit fiction or nonfiction because, you know, prose is very different. Um, and I've just started writing poetry myself. And so I was just, the, the, you know, the process you go through, when you're writing fiction or nonfiction, you know, you're creating a story or you're communicating, you know, a certain factual experience that you've been through. There are certain considerations. If you could share a little bit about mm. how you, when you know a, a poem is, complete, your, your process. I mean, I know you said for you it comes off the lip, but even in your head, what is the editing process that's happening? Well, I, I think um, with poetry, because of the way I work, it's a little bit subliminal, and I mean that in the full sense of the word subliminal, in the sense that um, there's a process of burning off, if you like, or, 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 or you know, chem a chemical, pro an alchemical process is going on that's actually happening while it's, while it's being built. People uh, uh, say, oh, I begin a poem with an, an image or, a, or, or an idea. I begin a poem with a rhythm, and sometimes that's a rhythm that's not, almost not attached to words even. There's this kind of feel of something. 
And, um, that, and, and, and I think it was Vita Zach for West who said that even in prose, style is rhythm. That's what makes your style. Um, so I think that the, 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 for me, when I get to the stage of writing things down, a lot of the uh, you know, dross has been burnt off already by the process. And Mandelstam writes a little bit about it, and I, and, and I can only really concur with him. What he did was, I mean, he composed a poem or a section of a poem in his head on the lips, writes it down, and sometimes there's a filler word that's completely ridiculous in there, and, and he knows that it sounds like it will suggest, at some stage it will suggest what the real word was. And so he writes this poem with, you know, cuckoo or parrot in the middle. Because he, he just knows there's a word, there's something there that fits that rhythm and it sounds something like that. And it turns out it was, you know, carrot. I, I don't think what cuckoo would be. <laughs> but um, that's that kind, of, that kind of alchemical process <coughs> with poetry. And so there's not a lot of editing that happens on the paper because there's not a lot of composing that happens on paper. For prose, it's just rewrite, 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 rewrite until the texture's right. Um, and I think... For me, the key for prose is that kind of texture. There's the rhythm that's underlying it. There's the, the texture of the language. And it has to be different, obviously, in different places. A poem tends to be you know, one breath, as it were. And it tends to be consistent through. But in a piece, of, especially in a longer piece of writing, you're going to be moving from something which might be intensely lyrical to something that's actually quite you know, ordinary. I think it's really important, and I think a lot of prose writers don't recognize this, is sometimes you have to write quite flat prose, you know? People say, why did you write that passage like that? And I said, because it had to be like that, because it was about a young girl far from home wandering around a dreary English market town in the rain trying to find food that she liked, you know? And you couldn't write a lyrical passage like that. It has to be kind of, you know, pretty ordinary. But of course, the other thing was that, um, and for me, there's always a game going on here, and sometimes it's visible, sometimes it's not. That this is a passage from my most recent novel, and that passage is actually a, a, a homage to Knut Hamsun's book, Hunger. Mm. And there's this passage, there's a, it's, in, it's actually very funny in a strange way, although it's horrific as well. This is this guy who's starving. He's a, he's a guy who wants to write, and um, he can't afford to, you know, he's trying to sell articles so he can get, buy some bread. And, he, you know, he ends up, you know, he, he'll eat cardboard, and he's just so hungry, he wants to fill his stomach. And the quality of the, the prose there matches that kind of sensation. So, I mean, it, it would be nice if, if we could all just write, a whole novel could be you know, high-flying, lyrical, beautiful stuff. But that would, that would it'd be like having a piece of music with climaxes all the way through. Mm. It just wouldn't work, you know. So, um, I, you know, it's a question of getting the texture and the, the pace, um, coming to a point where you can hit the reader with something something beautiful or something cruel. The, the, the happiest piece of criticism I ever had from anybody was my friend Robert Wrigley, poet who lives in America, lives in Idaho, and he read a story of mine in a magazine, and he said, I love the way you hurt your reader. <laughs> so, you know, and, and yeah, it's, it's like all kinds of cruelty. You have to prepare for it carefully mm -hmm. and just lay the groundwork. So to get that text, you have to just completely just get it down the page, it's rubbish the first time, you write it again, you write it again, you write it again, and you go on, and, and, and it might take 20, 30, I don't know how many times. There have been pa some passages just come flowing through. There's some just, just so naughty and difficult to untangle. So rewriting is the answer for prose. Question here, Lawrence. Sorry, there's just one question here. Sorry, and then sorry. Um, jo John Burnside, you're a, you're a, a great writer and a, and a writer of great stories. Um, and, a, and those stories loop through your poems as well. There's ghostly narratives that are strung through the longer poems in particular. Um, and your father was a storyteller mm. too. Mm. Is there good storytelling and bad storytelling? Uh, that's an interesting one, yeah. I think a story that's told to deceive it's usually a bad story. Um, I think of one of the things I teach at St. Andrews, I teach literary and ecology there, and one of the things we do is looking at the way in which language is used to lie about the environment. Um, and um, there are narratives that are being created now by big companies 
tr make themselves look green, say, or you know, d are doing less damage to the environment than, than they'd like to admit. And th they create narratives. Yeah, cause they know that if you make this little narrative about real people experiencing real joys because of their technology, say, um, they'll all believe that that's true. Um, there are kind, there are stories that are, you know, the, 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 the shells, the kind of meta fictions which are used politically, which I think are, are, are terrifyingly, you know, in, dishonest and destructive. Um, there's the story that basically just turns everything on its head, and you have to stop for a moment and think that's actually a narrative. For example, right now we're trying to get the Scottish government to stop using, stop allowing the use of neonicotinoids because there's a suspicion that they damage bee populations. Other countries have banned them. England hasn't banned them, so Scotland hasn't banned them because DEFRA says there's not enough evidence to say that they do damage bee colonies. It's a bit like saying, I'm going to pour pesticide over your child's head every day for the next 10 years, and then after 10 years, we'll know whether or not it harmed him. I, said, I would say, I'd rather you just didn't do that. <laughs> Um, and why, why do it? Um, why do it except for business interests? But the narrative has been created that the burden of proof is on people who object to this kind of activity. It used to be that if you produced a product, you had to prove that it was safe. And it's still what it says on, the, on paper in, in all of the you know, statutes, as it were, but that burden has been turned around. And it's, it's been seen that we're somehow denying benefits and we're, we're Luddite on anti-technology, anti-progress. If we say, no, let's not use it until we know it's safe. Because if we don't have any bees, we have nothing. Um, and that's a kind of narrative, and, 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 and I think people don't re recognize that. Now, because we know that politicians of all kinds tell all kinds of stories, and some of them are beautiful, and some of them are beautiful and true, really. But um, the most beautiful ones are often the ones that are most misleading. So those are, those are bad stories. I think anything that's, that comes out of the imagination and, is, and is, is told with as much integrity as the teller can muster is a good story. I might not agree with it, but if it comes from their imagination and it's told honestly, then I want, I want to listen to it. John Burnside, thank you very much. I think we're out thank of you. time, but thank you so much. Thank you. And um, I think, are you signing? Books, maybe? Yes. John, yeah, signing so books. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you, Vishani, for this wonderful session on fractured bones, fluid thoughts, <laughs> and fake memoirs. From uh, the organizers, we have a tiny little token of oh. <laughs> appreciation for the session. Thank you so much. The authors will be available for book signing at the book signing over there. We have people to escort you to the book signing place. Please don't forget to pick up your belongings. Uh, there are a lot of lost and found as we go through the sessions. Make sure you're carrying your bags and mobiles and cameras with you. Thank you so much. <laughs>